evening and welcome to Marxism 2016. What a time to be having a Marxism this year. Um, we're going to be having lots of meetings and opportunities for deba debate and discussion over the weekend. And this evening we have a great panel of speakers. I'm not going to announce everybody all at one go, um, but we're going to get started straight away with our first speaker. I'm really immensely, um, imme immensely brilliant to have um, our first speaker here tonight, who is going to have to dash off back to Birmingham. I'm a committed fighter against racism and war and um, CAGE Outreach Director, Mozam Beg. <laughs> Is that all I get? <laughs> you're all beautiful, you're wonderful, and I love you all. Um, I'm going to start by talking to you about a, a book. And this book is called The English, A Portrait of a People, and it's by Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> That's not even the half of it. In Guantanamo, the American soldiers often used to ask me, what's the best thing about England? And I'd say, jokingly, Scotland and Wales. <laughs> the MI5 gave me all sorts of things. They gave me a uh, hard time, they gave me interrogations, they gave me uh, complicity in torture, and they also gave me a copy of this book. And if you could see it, I'd show you, it actually says stamped, approved by US forces. <laughs> Many years later, after my release, I came and met, went on to Newsnight, met with Mr. Paxman for the first time, had this book with me. And I asked him this question. For the first time in his life, Jeremy Paxman had nothing to say. <laughs> I said, why do you think the security services of all people gave me a copy of your book? And he didn't know what to say. And he responded in the end by saying, I don't know why they gave me a copy of your book, but that's evidence of torture right there. <laughs> the reason I chose this book is because he says in this book that the English people, the British people, have a tendency to support the underdog. Now, while I, whilst I think that's a, a load of codswallop, if you look at history of what the empire has done, at least the notion, the idea, is something that we can all adhere to and think, yes, we all want to support the underdog. And the underdog is the one that, that is being targeted and being bullied and so forth. Y you all know now, obviously, what's happening in British politics and who the underdog is. And just so that you understand in comparison to what's happening to Jeremy Corbyn, that it's the people that are celebrated in this country, in the media and by other politicians uh, that are of like, are the war criminals, are those who are complicit in torture, are those who gave us the prevent policy, which has created and tried to make our teachers and our educators into informants and our students into suspects. And the people of that ilk are rallying together. It doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum they happen to be on. The people that voted for the war don't want a person with the integrity and the honesty of a man like Jeremy Corbyn coming into power. They don't want it at all because that's why the knives are out. And I know this from a personal, from great personal experience that you can, you can come back from torture and if you remain silent, it's all good. You're a good guy then. But if you start calling for accountability and justice and speaking truth to power, they will vilify you. 
They will target you. They will arrest you. They will do all sorts of things to you. But the one thing they cannot stand is that you keep standing up and standing firm and you are patient in the face of adversity. And that, my dear friends, my brothers, my sisters, my colleagues and, co and comrades, is that what we need to do. It is a, a great time of turmoil right now in the United Kingdom. And personally, I've never really been involved in any political party at all. But when the knives have come out in this way, when the vilification has come in this way, from such people who want to do away with the Human Rights Act, from such people who are our own mirrors of Donald Trump, just with better hairstyles. <laughs> Some people might dispute me on that. <laughs> Think about this, my friends. Chilcot's coming out next week. Is that perhaps the reason why all these coups are happening? Think about this also. The war on terror that began in 2001 has not ended because of our involvement in creating that war and that fiasco and that debacle that exists. In fact, if you look at what happened in Iraq, and as Obama has said recently, that the existence of ISIS there now is a consequence of, um, it's an unintended consequence. What do you mean? by unintended consequence. When you go to war, the consequence is death and destruction and strife and the breaking apart of countries. I can tell you now that the dropping of bombs of 15,000 pound daisy cutters is not unintended, it's very intended. It didn't just fall out of the plane by accident. And so, we're in a situation and a time now that our external policy has created such difficult and draconian internal policy. When the prevent policy, as we all know before, that was introduced by the Blair government, was already ridiculed and derided for being a failed, toxic brand, this government decided to make it into law and make it a statutory duty on our teachers, on our doctors, on our nurses, on everybody in the, uh, uh, the public sector to spy on those who they think are extreme. And what is an extreme? Let's just have it out. According to our Prime Minister, extremists are those who fail to uh, adhere to the rule of law, believe in democracy, and show mutual respect. <laughs> uh, my best friend, my best friend, is a man who was imprisoned in Guantanamo for 14 years without charge or trial. His children are all British and raised in this country and born. And the reason why he remained in Guantanamo for 14 years without charge or trial is because the British government was complicit in keeping him there and complicit in his torture as his head was repeatedly smashed against the wall while British intelligence services watched. Now let's get back to the rule of law. Kidnap, rendition, torture are crimes. If I was to do that to any of you, um, I'd be prosecuted, rightly so. If I was to watch while somebody else did it to somebody else, I'd be prosecuted for omission of my duty or being complicit in it. But because our security services have been involved in it, it's okay. Nobody's been prosecuted for these crimes to date. And it's from this culture of impunity that exists. You don't have to prosecute anybody involved complicit in torture. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to prosecute anybody that's involved in uh, the destruction of nations and the killing of hundreds of thousands of people. The reason why we went to war in Iraq was based on dodgy dossiers, but also on the torture of individuals. When I was held in the Bagram detention facility, the CIA said to me, if you do not cooperate, we will do to you what we did to Ibn al-Sheikh a Libya, a Libyan dissident who was tortured into giving a false confession that Saddam Hussein was working with al-Qaeda on obtaining weapons of mass destruction. Colin Powell used that statement at the Security Council in 2003 to argue and justify a case for war in Iraq, and the rest, as we say, is history. Out of that invasion, Al-Qaeda entered then into Iraq and became Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Then it metamorphosed into um, uh, Islamic State in Iraq. And then, after the Syrian uh, war and revolution, it became Islamic State in Iraq and Sham. And then it declared itself to be IS. 17 of the leaders of IS 
were held in Camp Bukka in Iraq in 2007, 2008, and were tortured by the Americans. Think about this. When they dress the prisoners and execute them um, horrifically, barbarically, wearing orange suits, we thought perhaps that there's some kind of bizarre solidarity with the Guantanamo prisoners, but that's not true at all. They were dressed in orange suits themselves. They are reaping back what they learnt in Abu Ghraib and in Camp Buka and elsewhere. In 2010, Obama blocked the publication of images from Iraq which showed the abuse, the torture and the rape of men, women and children because he said, and I quote, that it may damage our war effort and bring uh, harm to our soldiers. But the effort had already been damaged the moment you allow your troops to do something like this. Everybody in Iraq knows what happens, and that's the legacy. And so when we're talking about here in the United Kingdom that people stood up and marched against the war in their millions, that I heard about in my cell in Guantanamo when I was in solitary confinement, it gave me the first ever ray of hope that I've said many times that that war was taking place, but there were people in the streets that I knew so well in this country that I could be proud of, and you were amongst them. One of the few people that I've known from the beginning that's been campaigning and fighting for the people who've been dispossessed, the people who've been oppressed, the people who've been targeted, the refugees and the, the, the ordinary working man, Muslim communities and targeted criminalized communities is Jeremy Corbyn. He was there campaigning for Shakarama when it wasn't, um, when it wasn't fun, when it wasn't popular to do so. He was campaigning for Barbara Ahmed when nobody would stand with him. And so you see, when you've got a person like that of integrity, You've got somebody who stands up for principles compared to people who are simply career politicians. There's absolutely no contest. There's no contest at all. So, I just finish with this, say, to remain upbeat. There are turbulent times ahead of us, but remain upbeat. Out of adversity, good can emerge. And if we're patient and we're true to our principles, in the face of hardship, we can achieve great success. Thank you. Mozambique and, and solidarity. Thank you. Right, um, before leading on to our next speaker, I realised that I didn't introduce myself at the outset. Um, my name's Emma Davis and I'm a member of the SWP in Haringey and I'm also a teacher, a primary school teacher and um, we all know that we're going to be going out on strike next week so I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> Right, our next speaker is also fresh from her recent strike. Um, she is the chair of Welsh um, National Museum, PCS. Very, very pleased to have Hannah Lawson. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been to a Marxism conference, so uh, as has been the case for a lot of things for me over the past couple of years, it's a very steep learning curve. Um, I actually returned to work yesterday after two months on strike. <laughs> But as you can see, I'm here with you today. <laughs> um, as uh, as um, has been said, I'm from the National Museum of Wales. Uh, we cover six sites in our strike altogether. Uh, they're a very diverse set of sites. In fact, they're over 100 miles apart, some of them, and they don't even have the same first languages spoken at some of the sites. So our first challenge was uniting with each other uh, as much as uniting with anybody else. 
But I've got to say that ultimately, I think it, it proved that our differences, although they were a challenge at first, became ultimately our greatest strengths. And I think that that's something that we can all um, think about and all take away today. Um, the reasons behind the disputes are well documented. I don't want to bore you with them again. I know a lot of you have been following them. Um, but I would like to tell you what we won in our victory. We won five years of financial security for our members, four years pensionable, which was more than double anything that we'd been uh, offered previously. On top of that, we've, we are going to be having a reduction in weekend working um, so that the work-life balance and the family lives of our members who do so much weekend working uh, will be redressed a little bit better uh, in favour of their families and their social lives rather than um, simply working weekends and no longer getting financial recognition for it. Uh, we've also got uh, developed a closer working relationship with the Welsh Government. Uh, many of you may know this dispute, dispute was the longest running in the whole of our Welsh Assembly's history. Um, and we have moved from a union who had very little, if any, um, interaction and ties with Welsh Assembly Government officials to um, having trade union representation right at the heart of policy making and even the week after next we have been invited cordially to intent to uh, uh, make contributions <laughs> make contributions to our uh, heritage review and help to shape cultural policy for the whole of Wales so um, that to us is a really big part of the victory um, but perhaps the biggest part of all is the strong network of solidarity and campaigning groups um, all across not only this country but even internationally we've had support. The solidarity that we've been shown has been absolutely phenomenal and uh, that I think is the biggest victory of all and the thing that I really want to, to uh, press home today. When we first took the step of taking indefinite industrial action we had absolutely no idea what the outcome was going to be. Um, it wasn't a step that we took lightly at all. In fact, it was quite a frightening prospect for a lot of our members. Um, but I think there is a lot of scaremongering about going out on strike and um, we're very, very glad that we didn't listen to that because otherwise we wouldn't have had the victory that we had and we wouldn't have the strength and the unity and the solidarity that we have now. Uh, we had huge inspiration from the rest of our sector in PCS, the culture sector. Uh, our colleagues at the National Museum Scotland have recently had a victory in their dispute after industrial action. And, um, of course, the hugely inspirational campaign from the National Gallery um, was, played a massive, massive role in our decision and our victory, and I would really like to thank Candy Edwin for all of her huge, huge contribution to that. Um, I haven't got very long left, so I just wanted to talk about some of the people, the many, many, many people that we've made links with at the moment. Um, there have been uh, people's assembly groups all over Wales who've come along and helped us. There have been people from all sorts of different campaigning groups at grassroots levels, like, um, for example, Cardiff Against the Cuts, which we uh, marched alongside and did eventually get those cuts reversed to um, Cardiff uh, Arts Institutions. Welsh Books Grants, who we battled alongside, those cuts were also re uh, reversed. Um, we've um, teamed up with Unite Against Fascism for their um, events. We were really, really proud to be there in Swansea for a big uh, anti-white pride demonstration and to um, be part of that. We have also been joining up with other disputes, Biz in Sheffield, the Junior Doctors. We've been really proud to stand alongside those. Um, our comrades in Wood Street who have still got an ongoing dispute and who are with us tonight and I'd just like to have a quick shout out solidarity to you guys. And of course the Bakers Union who um, have been striking in Newport and we've been visiting each other's picket lines 
Um, so, yeah, I just want to wrap up quickly, really, and say that we couldn't have done it by ourselves. We couldn't have done it just in our union in PCS. We probably couldn't have even done it just within the trade union movement, although I have to say that the solidarity and the help that we've had in terms of time, resources, money, and um, good feeling from Unite, Unison, FBU, Baker's Union has been absolutely phenomenal. But really, it was everybody outside of... Um, outside of and inside of the trade union movement, the grassroots movement, ordinary members of the public, and people like you guys who have spent so much of your time helping us, coming to our picket lines, and keeping us going when things were looking bleak. So solidarity to everybody else who is on strike, and we genuinely, genuinely mean this, that if there are any branches or unions who are looking to go on and take industrial action, please come and talk to us because we want to help you. We want to tell you about the, the things that we found successful and didn't and return some of the massive solidarity that we've been shown. So thank you very much. Oh, and, and one more point before I go. Um, you might have seen some of the images in the background of um, various bits and pieces from our dispute. It's been a very creative campaign, as you can see from the bubbles, plasticine dinosaurs, wheels, looms, and goodness knows what else. Um, but two of our really, really massive supporters in this dispute were Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, and I just want to show them solidarity back now. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Hannah. Our next speaker is a committed leader in the struggle against blacklisting and against the corruption at the heart of the police. I'm very pleased to have Dave Smith from the Blacklist Support Group. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I first came to Marxism in 1990s when I was, uh, when I still had air, uh, to be honest. Uh, and, uh, uh, at the time, I was a uh, shop steward on uh, picket lines in, uh, on building sites in London. And at the time, we were campaigning against asbestos. We were campaigning against uh, workers who were dying on building sites. We were campaigning against uh, unpaid wages. Uh, and when we came, we got great solidarity. People cheered us. Um, uh, but what we didn't realise is uh, there were other people looking at us at the time as well. And the people who were looking at us at the time as well was the employers. Now, I never expected the employers to like me particularly uh, very much as a, uh, as a, as a union activist, uh, but quite the extent that they didn't like us, uh, we weren't really uh, prepared for. Um, seven years ago, um, and it was virtually uh, to this week, seven years ago to this week, we held a meeting uh, in the House of Commons. There were 10 people at it. Um, and the reason we had the meetings is because a government department had done a raid uh, on this shady organisation that no one had ever heard before called the Consultant Association, and they found these secret files that construction companies were keeping uh, on building uh, activists uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the construction industry. Uh, we got their files, we looked at them, we said, come on, someone's got to run a campaign, and after saying someone else should run it, someone else should run it, we decided, all right, we're going to have to bloody run it, aren't we? Uh, uh, and we? And we set up uh, the Blacklist uh, Support Group. That was seven years ago. This is 10 blokes standing in a room. Uh, uh, we didn't have, even have a proper committee room in the House of Commons uh, uh, when we did it. And we said, come on, we'll run this campaign. Um, and this is one of them where you think you can't win it on your own. 10 people can't win a campaign against who we were fighting against. We were fighting against the biggest multinationals in this country. Sir Robert McAlpine Limited, they built the Olympic Stadium. Skanskas, they built the Olympic Media Centre. All of these people, they're the biggest multinationals, and it was the directors of their companies that were meeting, having secret meetings once every three months to discuss union activists. 
They had files on 3,200 workers, and every time someone applied to get a job on one of their building sites, they would check to see if your name was on this list, and if your name was on the list, you'd be sacked or you wouldn't be given a job. And that's what they're trying to do, to get rid of people like us on their building sites. And to give you an idea of scale, look, people sometimes think this is just about managers having a quiet word with each other in a pub. Every time they checked a name on a list, it cost them two pounds because we got the invoices. When it was closed down, it was when they were building the Olympic Stadium. So Robert McAlpine built the Olympic Stadium. When their last invoice was 28,000 pounds. <laughs> this is industrial scale, systematic. This is labor versus capital. Yeah. They don't want us on their building sites. <laughs> And we have gone from 10 people in a room because seven years ago they denied everything. Despite the evidence, despite the documentary evidence, they refused to admit everything. It fought us in every single employment tribunal, refused to give us a penny. And we said, well, if you ain't going to fight, we ain't going to win in the employment tribunals, we're going to fight you on the streets. We pulled out Crossrail in this dispute, not once. People, on this, people in this room were on the picket lines with us at six o'clock in the morning when we shut down Crossrail. We did Oxford Street, not once. We shut it down 20 times with people in the middle of Oxford Street. When, when they had the National Building Awards in the Grosvenor Hotel in Park Lane, we had 300 construction workers dancing the Irish jig across four lanes uh, of Park Lane to shut that thing down. And when they turned up in their, in their dinner jackets, we told them uh, what we thought of them. We've had strikes, we've occupied their head offices, we've had blockades. What we've been part of, what we're most proud of, is a resurgence of rank and file militancy in this country. That's what we're proud of. It's, it's not just the building industry. The, Wood Street, the Wood, Wood Street cleaners are down here this morning. Give them people a round of applause. They're bloody inspiration. <laughs> whether it's been in the galleries, whether it's been the firefighters, whether it's been the junior doctors, it's grassroots militancy that's come into the fore. We should be proud of what's happening. There is an absolute rebirth that's going on here. And seven years ago, there was 10 of us in a room. Seven weeks ago, I stood in the high court. I stood in the high court when 20 of the biggest multinationals in this country had to stand up and make a groveling apology for what they bloody <laughs> did to us. <laughs> they, they have refused to pay us a penny seven years ago, seven weeks ago, multi-million pound compensation payment to every single person on that list. Let them pay, it's in their pockets that we make them pay. This, the victory for blacklisting isn't a victory for the 3,200 people who are on that list. It's a victory for the trade union movement. It's a historic victory and we should be proud of it. But, but when they were giving us the apology, their QC, who was being paid, I think he got paid half a million quid for that uh, thing, we were told. Um, uh, their QC stood up, and as he was reading out, we, we consider this a, a full apology, and we draw a line behind it. 40 construction workers wearing blacklisted T-shirts stood up in the middle of the eye court and shut the courtroom down for more than five minutes, chanting, No justice! No justice! No justice! No peace! The judge wasn't very impressed, I can tell you that. Uh, now, look, and the point is, it isn't justice. We're not, the, yes, we've had a victory, but we're not going away. Why? Because it's not just the big companies, it's the undercover coppers that were spying on us as well. Whether it's Bob Neer, whether it's Bob Lambert, Carl O'Neary, Mark Jenner, Peter Francis, every single one of those undercover coppers I knew, some of them attended the meeting, didn't just attend the meeting, some of us chaired the meetings that we were at. 
Campaigns about improving safety on building sites, the undercover coppers are chairing the meetings. They're spying and infiltrating on trade unionists looking for better health and safety on building sites. And if that information during the Thatcher period from the undercover police was given to Thatcher and was given to Conservative Home Secretaries, was that information given to Labour Home Secretaries? Was that information given to Jack Straw, to David Blunkett, to the Blair Eye Home Secretaries who were spying on the trade union movement? When we had that first ever meeting in the House of Commons, there was 10 of us and one MP turned up. The MP who turned up was John McDonnell, and he chaired our meetings, and he's been at every single meeting of the Blacklist Support Group ever since. <laughs> on, whenever we've had a protest, whether it's six o'clock in the morning, whether it's late at night, whether it's union conferences or in the parliament, McDonnell and Corbyn have been there. They, McDonnell and Corbyn, have stood with us, with blacklisted workers, when we were under attack. We stand with McDonnell and Corbyn now, when they're under attack from those Blairite rats. Solidarity. Thank you. This spring we've seen the absolutely enormous victories for the survivors and the families of the 96. And so it fills me with immense pleasure to welcome our next speaker, um, Sheila Coleman, Hillsborough Justice Campaign. And I'd like to start by thanking you for the support you've given us through inviting us here over many years and providing us with a platform when very few other organizations would. We never forget those who helped us and stood by us through what I describe as the very dark years. Um, a lot of what has gone before, uh, Mozam and, and Dave and Hannah, I can identify so much with and that we, we draw these threads. It's so important that we do. The, the 26th of April this year, the jury in Warrington, um, after two years of inquest, returned verdicts of unlawful killing in all cases of those who were killed at Hillsborough. Um, everyone was asking us, were we happy? You know, how the hell can you be happy with something like that? You can't even feel satisfied. You feel angry. You feel incredibly angry because you think of those who've died along the way. And you also think that they established after 27 years something that was known about 27 years ago. <laughs> never, never has a disaster had more eyewitness accounts, more evidence, more video footage, and yet it was a cover-up and a conspiracy, finally acknowledged by the state in 2012. If they can do that in the face of so much evidence, what can they do to individuals who face individual miscarriages of justice? I spoke in Sheffield the other night and came away in tears having listened to a man who had come just to approach me, um, a middle-aged Irishman who had been uh, left for dead several years ago. And then his treatment at the hands of South Yorkshire police was horrendous and nothing has ever come of his case. And it's people like him that we need to remember. Um, we were fortunate in that we could harness a lot of strength along the way. After 27 years, we get unlawful killing. And I'd argue we got that because the Hillsborough Justice Campaign was a grassroots campaign formed nine years after the disaster when families who were aware of the injustices and who had a sense of class politics um, joined forces with survivors and others who had a broader sense of injustice took it away from the arena of football because people wanted to locate it just within football. They didn't want to see it as a major miscarriage of justice. Um, amazing that a campaign so formed so long after could reach um, such success, but we did that by getting out there 
and be, responding to invitations such as yours, joining in marches, joining the dots when other people didn't want us to. What I would point to is when the inquest, the new inquest were formed in 2014, the police haven't apologised in 2012 and said they were sorry, they were wrong, whatever. Once again, use the coroner's court as an adversarial arena to blame fans, to blame survivors. They had the top lawyers funded by the Home Office. It ran into millions. And they used it to once again roll out the old lies and myths about drunken, ticketless hooligans. They once again wheeled out local residents with their stories from statements they'd made in 1989. Individuals, a lot of some of them survivors, did their own homework. It wasn't the lawyers. And they found these connections with these so-called random residents who came back to court to give the evidence of how awful the Liverpool fans were and what they were told. And they made some very interesting links. One local resident, for example, that was particularly scathing, turned out to be the daughter of one of the senior officers in charge on the day. That's just one example. I could list many more. And these are now being catalogued and put forward to the DPP. Um, this was a conspiracy, no two ways about it. And it's ordinary people that have done incredible groundbreaking work on this. Um, what really saddens me is, um, along the way, when we kind of, I, I use the analogy of the Grand National, even though I don't support it, but once we'd got over Beaches Brook and we were on the home straight, people were falling over themselves to join us. Labour politicians, uh, other people close, closer connected to us who were a little bit wary of, you know, linking in with us. But it wasn't just that they wanted to join us. They want to take over. They want to rewrite history. I'm telling you now, they want to write the Hillsborough Justice campaign out of it all. And I'll give a concrete example in a minute that I mightn't be very popular for, but I've never worried about being popular, as those of you who know me will attest. Um, there's a journalist who is attend attested with, you know, right, and he has written good stuff and monitored the Hillsborough proceedings, uh, the inquest. But today, David Conn from The Guardian tweeted how wonderful it was the job Theresa May had done around Hillsborough. He tweeted it. He tweeted it by saying, she, you know, the context was she was the preferred option to Boris Johnson. I answered him. I replied by saying um, she, it was very expedient at the time for her to support us and you have to view it within the context of the agenda for privatising the police force. And I hashtagged it, context is all. And to my mind, she's been quietly waiting in the wings with this recent Ferrara shining her Jimmy shoes, waiting to get them on. And she will, she, and she's coming out now. I would liken that. So for me, there, you'll have to excuse me, my chin keeps bleeding because I actually, in true Scouse style, decided to chin a pavement on the Tottenham Court Road, <laughs> running here earlier. So uh, yeah, I'm here as the walking wounded, I have to say. Um, and no alcohol was involved either. <laughs> but... Um, when people who have linked in with families start singing the praises of Tory MPs at a very senior level, I question it. I further question the Labour MPs who have taken Hillsborough families under their wing. These Hillsborough families weren't around in, in rec until recent times. And I would argue that they are co-opting people, as they always do. When you become dangerous, they co-opt you. Well, we won't be co-opted. We refuse to be co-opted. We've never played party politics with Hillsborough. And as I've said many times before, uh, the Labour, government, Labour Party was in office for much longer than the Tories over Hillsborough and compounded the cover-up, mainly through Jack Straw. Let's not forget that. And I'll tell you what's happening now. There's a real attempt here to, not, to have us 
keep them well apart from each other. And I can tell you, there's a concerted attempt to keep the Hillsborough Justice Campaign and the Orgreave Campaign well apart. <laughs> Although the Justice Campaign has long supported the Orgreave uh, Truth and Justice Campaign, we were not invited to their recent rally. Rather, the um, Hillsborough Family Support Group representatives were invited uh, on the understanding that I wouldn't be present at the rally. Um, I see that I've got, you know, a brother on the panel there from the Rotherham 12. Hillsborough, Orgreave, Rotherham 12, South Yorkshire Police. No wonder they want to keep us apart. <laughs> but one thing I would say is, I do believe we're making progress. This time of flux is exciting for me. I'm not going to be negative about it. I'm going to be positive about this because we fought when, when it, through many dark years. We're going to stay. We're going to stay. We're going to move on this. Um, Co Mozan mentioned uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the support, and he's been further mentioned. I was reminded today, a good friend of mine now dead, Jerry Conlon of the Guildford Four, acknowledges Jeremy in his book, proved innocent. Jeremy's got a long track record and one that we must support. I come today from being with people who are members of uh, Angela Eagle's constituency and they're doing a good fight there because they are, she is refusing to acknowledge that they're back in Corbyn. And, but I'll finish on this point that what concerns me is you know we've got something, we've got unlawful killing, there might be prosecutions, I don't know. Or grieve will get something, but the focus of attention will be on the police and the people who will be let off the hook is the state. Let's not forget it was Thatcher government under, when Hillsborough happened, when Orgreave happened. Let's not forget the state are reorganising. So I will be not bought off by the Burnhams of this world in the Labour Party. <laughs> And I have to say, Andy Burnham is another one who's very quietly waiting in the wings at the moment. Watch this space, because I'm not fooled. But I will not stand by and watch Hillsborough and people who fought and died be appropriated by careerist politicians. And I will continue to fight to lay the blame where it should be because the police acted with impunity because the state had sanctioned their behaviour throughout all these cases that we are listening to tonight. Once again, thank you for the longevity of your support to us. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Our next speakers um, are joining us at, uh, fresh from their fourth week of all-out strike in the heart of the City of London. Um, please give a warm welcome to Juan and Victor from United Voices of the World. Buenas tardes. Ustedes no me conocen todavía, pero me hago presente. Soy Víctor Manuel y gracias a Voces Unidas vengo a hablar unas palabras. Thank you very much for having me here. My name is Victor Manuel. I'm from the Union United Voices. Uh, and uh, you don't know me, but perhaps you will know me a little more, a little more after this. <laughs> en el mundo hay injusticias acerca del trabajador. Y esto tiene que cambiar. In the world, there are so many injustices uh, which workers face, and that has to change. Las injusticias podemos nosotros defender uniéndonos con un solo puño. We can beat this injustice by uniting. Si no hay la unión, no podemos vencer al capitalismo. If there's no solidarity, then we've got no chance of beating capitalism. Para un cambio, tenemos que tener dignidad, y esa dignidad la hace el trabajador honradamente. 
To achieve change, we need dignity, and workers have, it, and workers have that. Workers have dignity. Estoy aquí con mi compañero por las injusticias que hay en la vida y por las injusticias de las empresas de, de las empresas de limpieza. I'm here with my comrade and my colleague uh, because of the injustices we both faced uh, working for this cleaning company. No se trata de una fuerza. Se trata de una unión para que esa unión sea transformada en los venideros para el trabajador. ¿Cómo? Esto, perdón. Sorry, guys, I have to check the translation. Perdón. Sorry. <laughs> no se trata. Pero en otras palabras, porque la, la forma que lo pusiste. Yeah, yeah but I couldn't understand. I couldn't, I couldn't understand that, but... <laughs> Shit, sorry. <laughs> en, otro, en otras palabras. Para poder cambiar una sociedad... In order to change society, tenemos que tener la fuerza. We need strength. No humillarnos. Okay. Humillarnos. We cannot be humiliated. Sino tener la frente en alto. We need to have our heads held high. Para vencer. In order to beat. Lo que es el trabajo. Lo que es el trabajo. Lo que, sí, claro. <laughs> lo que es el trabajo. La dignidad es todo. Si no hay dignidad. El empresario jamás nos va a respetar. Dignity is everything. It's not negotiable. They'll never respect us unless we keep our dignity. Somos soldados de guerra. We are soldiers of war. Y la guerra va continuamos. And the war will continue. Uniéndonos. Uh, uh, Unifying us, uniting, para vencer, in order to win, y siempre a la victoria siempre. And until the victory, always. Oh, hasta la victoria. Hasta la victoria. Igualmente puedo manifestar de que me siento contento de estar en este evento con todos ustedes y estar con personas de ideas progresistas. I'm very happy to be here and to be with people who share my uh, progressive ideas. Nosotros llevamos con el día de hoy 23 días de huelga indefinida en el 100 Wood Street. Today is the 23rd day of our strike at 100 Wood Street. Y posiblemente si no se soluciona nada en estos días venideros, el día lunes estaré personalmente empezando una huelga de hambre. If we, if we don't win this week, on Monday the 4th of July, I will begin a hunger strike. Hemos venido luchando, hemos estado luchando, y seguiremos sin tener miedo a las represalias de seguir luchando, pero ¿por qué vamos a seguir luchando? We've been fighting and, we'll, and we will continue fighting. We're not afraid, uh, we're not afraid of any repercussions we may, uh, 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 we may face. Esta lucha es por nuestras ideas, por nuestra dignidad, por el respeto al trabajador. This fight is about our ideas, about our dignity, about respect for workers. Solamente así podremos alcanzar sueldos dignos y respeto para el trabajador. Only this way can we win, winning, uh, win living wages and respect for workers. Vamos a seguir luchando, compañeros, en alcanzar la conciencia de nuestros amigos para que de esa forma estar unidos y podernos sindicalizarnos y solamente así seremos fuertes. We can, we're going to continue fighting, increasing our consciousness and uh, forever unifying in order to become stronger. Sí, sí, ya. Ajá. Okay, just... Todos ustedes van a ser mi inspiración, al igual que el Sindicato de Bases Unidas, para que todo salga bien la semana venidera. Thank you very much. You're an inspiration. You're an inspiration, and thank you very much. Thank you, Juan and Victor. Our next speaker has been leading in the fight against the racism of the police and the state. Please give a warm welcome to Vakas Hussain from the Rotherham 12 Defence Campaign.
Thank you, friends and comrades, for giving me the opportunity to come here and speak to you for the next few minutes. I come from a town in South Yorkshire that many of you probably wouldn't have heard of until a couple of years ago. It's now become infamous for a grotesque and vile grooming scandal that took place. And unfortunately, what transpired that many of the perpetrators involved in that scandal were from the Pakistani Muslim community, something that these men shared with myself. But contrary to popular belief, and as some of you may have been bought, in, bought into, there wasn't a perpetuated cover-up of this crime by the Pakistani community or the Muslim community. In fact, there was a cover-up, and this cover-up was perpetuated and committed by the very same police force that Sheila spoke about in her speech, South Yorkshire Police. And the South Yorkshire police, in their cover-up, were aided and abetted by Rotherham Borough Council. But all this has been missed in the media narrative and in the media frenzy afterwards. Because the South Yorkshire police are masters of propaganda, because when the scandal broke, they said that it was the Muslim community's fault. They stayed silent. They were too sensitive in being challenged, so we turned a blind eye. And we faced the vitriol, we faced the backlash for something that we never did. And our town became a staging post for far-right fascists. We have, in, from August 2014 up until this year, last month in fact, we've had about 16 far-right demonstrations. And on every occasion, there was some sort of counter-protest led by our comrades from Unite Against Fascism, many of whom I'll see here. And it saddens me to say that they didn't receive popular support of my community at these demonstrations. We were advised by the police. We probably shouldn't have been listening to their advice, knowing what we know now. <laughs> and by our mosques and our community leaders to stay away. That they let the fascists come, let them uh, say their little things, and then let them go back home. And what good did that do us? It caused women to be attacked in the street, women who wore the hijab, who were visibly Muslim, they were attacked. It led to our mosques being ransacked and vandalized and broken into. It led to taxi drivers being beaten to within an inch of their lives. And it culminated in August 2015 with an 81-year-old Muslim grandfather being murdered whilst he was on his way to the mosque. And what we learned at the trial, that before he was murdered, he was racially abused, he was called a paedophile, he was called a groomer amongst many other racist tropes before he was savagely murdered. And what happened when this gentleman died, we as a community said, well, we've, took, we've heeded your advice, we've had enough of staying at home, we're going to come out. So we did, we came out on the 5th of September last year to oppose Britain's first, and we met with a police force that were intent on beating us. They kettled us for hours on end. They batten and charged us and, uh, with their horses for no apparent reason. And in the end, they set us up. They forced us to walk past a pub, which is known for its far-right tendencies, without any police presence there. And when we walked past it, we were attacked by fascists with bottles, with racist language. We were called packies, we were called terrorists. And our children who were there, they were beaten by these men. And 12 men who came forward to defend themselves and defend these children and defend people like me who were marching in solidarity with Mohsin Ahmed who had been murdered. They were arrested by the police force and this October they faced violent disorder charges and if convicted they faced years in prison simply for defending themselves, their community and as I say people like me. And the reason the police force can get away with doing this as Sheila said, and as David said, the state and South Yorkshire police have been acting with impunity. Nobody has stood up and challenged their, their, uh, their sort of challenged their culture of getting away with things. And it's sad that this has come to this. So, I mean, there's a few things that I want from people here. First of all, I want you to go back and tell your trade unionists, tell your workers and colleagues about our campaign. And on the 3rd of October, we're having a massive rally outside Sheffield Crown Court because the 3rd of October is the start of the trial. 
And we, I want as many of you people there in attendance to come and show solidarity with the 12 men because I don't want just the 12 being on trial. I want hundreds and thousands of people, progressive people, who believe in the working class struggle to stand with their men and say that this, this is an injustice and that this should not be happening. Uh, so, I mean, just simply uh, spread the message, get the word out, and thank you for inviting us here. Thank you very much. We've seen the huge rise and struggle of workers and students against the government in France. So it gives us immense pleasure to welcome now Axel Pearson, a striking French rail worker. So hello everybody and thank you for this uh, warm reception. My name is Axel, I'm a train driver and also the general secretary of the CGT Trade Union's Railway Workers Branch in Trappes, which is a city that was built around its railway yard in the southern suburbs of Paris. I've been asked to speak about the ongoing struggle in France led by the working class against what the social government led by François Hollande has labeled its labor bill. This new bill that you may have heard of ambitions to destroy the foundations of our labor legislation by facilitating mass sackings, amongst other things. It also aims to allow bosses to impose contracts violating the labor code and the national collective agreements who would no longer be binding as they are today in each workplace, regardless of size or union density. Their aim, of course, as in much of Europe and more generally across the planet, is of course to lengthen the work week to lower our wages, and it is a general attack on all our, all our job security. Eighty years after the general strike in 1936 that gave birth to much of this labor code and the national collective agreements, it is ironic that the charge against them, one of the, one of the most violent charges against them, is being led by a social democratic government in 2016. In addition to this, the railway workers, such as myself, are subject to an intense attack by the national-owned railway company, which we call the SNCF, which is the equivalent of your former British Rail. The, f the government is paving the way for the privatization of the railway industry by walking in the footsteps of what happened in Great Britain in the 90s. The propaganda our management is pushing through within our industry conveys the message that if we don't accept massive cuts in terms of jobs and working conditions, we would not be competitive enough to win the franchises against future private operators when the railway will be, will be liberalized in a few years. To that, we answer, of course, politically, that the railway must stay under public control in order to deliver a decent, reliable, cheap, and extensive service for the traveling public. And, and we do not accept that the liberalization be used as a pretext to downgrade our already difficult and dangerous working conditions. The railway workers from the public company have thus embarked upon the road of a struggle aimed at ensuring, of course, that their terms and conditions be maintained and improved, but even more importantly, we have, inter we have entered this phase of industrial action side by side with all railway workers from the private operators who already exist in the freight transport to demand that our terms and conditions from the public company be used as a strict minimum for all railway workers under private contract and not the other way around. The strikes and demonstrations have gained momentum since the 9th of March on all these fronts simultaneously. High school and university, uh, university students have since gone on demonstrations and organized blockades, stirring things up and helping to accelerate the response from the working class. The counterattack started with massive 24-hour strikes in several sectors, amongst which a nearly paralyzed railway on the 9th of March. As you may have known, repression, racism, Islamophobia, and the rise of the far-right National Front has dominated French politics for the last four years. But as the streets have filled with millions of demonstrators, focus has, for now at least, been put back on class struggle and labor organizing the fight back across all sections of the working class. This does not mean that the National Front has disappeared, of course, not even that its support base has dwindled, but it shows us the way which to take to force it into mediatic silence, at least for now. 
The movement, this movement has unleashed all the anger and resentment that has been simmering throughout Hollande's presidency. Our comrades in the oil industry took the necessary initiative to take the struggle forward in this context by going out on the 20th of May on an, on on an all-out limited strike in all the eight oil refineries in France. They were followed by some dock workers, most notably in the in Le Havre uh, city, which is actually not that far away from England. Some railway workers in some of the more radical depots went out at the same time, but a majority of them joined in the unlimited strikes two weeks later as the CGT union finally decided to call out all railway workers on an unlimited strike starting on the 1st of June. As truck workers, garbage workers, railway workers, air traffic controllers, oil workers, dock workers, some metal workers went out on strike, organized road blockades, pickets, as oil shortage spread throughout the country and garbage piled up in the streets of Paris, the government backpedaled on some aspects in order to save what it deemed essential. For us railway workers, for example, the government has at least temporarily backed down on the attacks it wanted to implement against our terms and conditions. Truck workers have received assurances that their overtime will not suffer the lower rate that this law tries to, uh, tries to implement. The government has removed some of the aspects of the bill, such as the slashing of the compensation for unfair dismissal, for example. But the government has uh, dismanaged to diffuse the situation a bit by granting sectoral demands. But the government is determined to maintain the legal possibility for bosses to no longer abide by the national standards. It has also backpedaled yesterday, actually, a bit on this issue as well, announcing that it will maintain several domains under which no employer will be allowed to go under, but not in all aspects. The government has beaten a historic record of impopularity since the beginning of our strikes, who has even managed to divide the parliamentary majority. The government did not manage to push the bill through a parliamentary vote given a lack of majority and use what has now become the famous 49.3 article of the French Constitution, which allows the government to push through a bill without debate and vote on the issue, even in a bourgeois parliament. The bill is due to get back in July for a second round of discussion, and even though the all-out strikes have come to an end as we speak in most sectors for now, the anger is still high and demonstrations are still organized, and the next one will be on the 5th of July, that is next Tuesday. The Solidarity Strikes Funds have seen money pour in from all over the country, which is a strong sign of the massive support we have had from public opinion on this fight. Whatever happens now, we will know that this is not over, and all the anger that has been unleashed will not extinguish itself. The government hopes that the summer holidays will bring an end to the agitation, but nothing is less certain. There's a famous song, I know many of you know it, that calls for workers to rise from the slumbers. Millions of us have now arisen from our slumbers, and in my train depot, and, is, and it is by far no exception, we've come out stronger from this strike than when we started. Loads of young, unorganized workers joined us, organized, elevated their class consciousness by confronting themselves to the bosses, riot police in our pickets, while we blockaded road and oil depots. One of them, as we, uh, one of them, as we voted to return to work after 18 days of unlimited strike, said in our General Assembly of Strikers, with tears in his eyes, I have never been more alive than during the 18 days we've just spent together. <laughs> political, political action and industrial action must supplement and sustain each other. For it is in these moments that we pave the way, not only for resistance against immediate attacks, but also craft the minds of millions of workers to prepare them for a radical change in society. When you have fought and organized industrially, when you see that as you withdraw your labor massively, society is paralyzed, you can come to the practical conclusion that you, can, that you can also manage as well as operate your industry. You will soon realize that you do not need the idle masters and exploiters because they are simply parasites. They, they do not employ you as you imagine, but you employ them to take from you what you produce, and that is how this society works. We can never be free while we work and live by the sufferance because we must own our own tools and then only will we will control our own jobs and enjoy the products of our own labor. Only then will we be free men and women instead of the industrial slaves that ever condemned us to be. I have absolute confidence in the fact that in due time our hour will strike and the struggle we've led in France for the past weeks and months now as all struggles that have been led across the planet have brought us a bit closer to it. Thank you for having listened. Thank you, Axel.
And can I just note that there'll be another chance to hear Axel on Friday afternoon of Marxism. And also there'll be another um, opportunity to hear Sheila Coleman as well on Saturday afternoon. Right, our next speaker I'm very pleased to announce, a recently elected People Before Profit TD from Dublin and member of the SWP, Breed Smith. Thanks, comrades, and I'll accept that applause for all six of us who got elected in the South and two in the North. <laughs> I'm not forgetting uh, Eamon McCann and Jerry Carroll, of course, in Belfast. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but I was really inspired to hear the previous speaker and just thinking about the, the expression, an ounce of struggle is worth a ton of oats. And indeed, they've got, they've got the ton of struggle and we've got the ton of oats, but it's great to see them. <laughs> Um, um, it's great to see what's happening in the world. In fact, uh, this country, all eyes in Ireland were on this country for the last week. Uh, the Brexit, uh, unless you don't realise it, but I think you probably do, has opened up a major hornet's nest for the ruling class right across the world. It's been incredible. <laughs> and I think that um, when, for, for us in Ireland, when we look at what's happened in terms of the vote to leave, you have to acknowledge, of course, that some of it was about racism and uh, xenophobia and the, the, the far right and horrible creatures like um, Farage and even worse creatures like Boris Johnson in some way. <laughs> and probably worst of all, when you think about the, 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 the hypocr hypocrisy and the characterization of him, was Cameron himself who put out the idea to have this vote and play the racist card on the Remain side, as did many Labour people. Absolutely appalling. The racist card was played on both sides. There was very little uh, opposition to that right-wing agenda. And if one lesson has to be learned from it, that is that everywhere we stand up against racism, xenophobia and fascism completely and utterly at every opportunity. But they cannot deny, they cannot deny, and they're, it's killing them, they're biting their tongues, they cannot deny that a huge proportion of this vote was a backlash against the tyrants, the economic and political tyrants that represent the European Union. Those who brought down absolute horror on the people of Ireland when they bailed out, forced us to bail out the banks for 68 billion euro, their toxic banks. The people of Ireland are still paying for that. They were very able overnight to cut loan parents, to cause a trolley crisis, a housing crisis, to cut dole, to cut off people from disability and medical cards, to create a higher rate of suicide than we've ever had before, to evict tens of thousands of people from their homes because they couldn't pay their mortgage or their rent. Very able to do that overnight. But at the same time, they sowed the seeds of deep, deep bitterness and they exposed their hand. The EU is nothing but a bunch of bosses bullies who are pushing an agenda of war, capitalism and pain across the world. And I think probably even more interesting is what it has opened up in terms of the battle in this country for the hearts and minds of uh, both the members of the Labour Party and the Labour Party voters, the people who did, in their droves, vote to exit because they are alienated, disillusioned and pissed off with the system. And that battle, I want to say tonight clearly, and I said it in the dial today, the left in Ireland stands squarely with Jeremy Corbyn against the right warmongering uh, opponent that he's facing. And it will be an, amazing, uh, it'll be an amazing consequence, I think, for the left everywhere, because the same arguments that uh, are facing the Labour Party about whose side are you on and what side of left you want are the same arguments we're having in Ireland. And funny enough, we're getting it really from Sinn Féin, uh, who are now critical, very critical, of people before profit for supporting a Brexit, um, very critical of people before profit and blatantly lying that we don't support a united Ireland, that we're two nationists. And of course we're absolutely uh, putting a, a, a cart and 20 through that, but their real problem is that they're a bit, they're a bit like uh, the opponents of Corbyn in the Labour Party. They believe that they can reform the EU, 
that they want to tag on to it in order to keep stability, that there's something in it for them all, and they also want to dominate the left. They're not going to be able to do it by tagging on to a bunch of bullion economic tyrants that is represented by Europe, and that's exactly what they've done by supporting the Brexit vote in the North. Nevertheless, the people of Northern Ireland, the people of Scotland, have a right to make their own decisions. That's their democratic will, and we support that. But for us, I think we have to go back to what brought us uh, into the Doyle, what brought six uh, TDs into the Doyle of the radical left, of the revolutionary left. And it was the emergence of the great uh, and fantastic movement against the water charges and the privatisation of this most precious natural resource. And the ink was hardly dry on the Brexit result when the European Union began to bully the Irish people again and told us, sorry, mate, we're not having it. You're going to have to pay your water charges. There's no derogation. We're coming after you again. I mean, how arrogant. Where do these people get off? They rub salt in the wounds and add insult to injury on working class people everywhere. So I think this is opening a real challenge for the left everywhere to decide which way we want society to go. And for us, it's very important that we have those voices uh, in the Dáil and particularly in Stormont. And having them both at the same time, has to be said, is a historic breakthrough. North and South revolutionaries who stand on the shoulders of giants like James Connolly and call for a 32-county socialist republic on the anniversary of the 1916 rising, it's quite something. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got an awful lot more to say other than there is this amazing battle for the hearts and minds of the people here. And I think there's a challenge to socialists everywhere to learn how to engage in the, where people are at, in the struggles that they're at, uh, and at the same time to put those demands into a context where people understand they can fight for these demands, they can fight for reforms, but we have to, as revolutionaries, reach out to those people in a language and in a manner that can convince them you can fight for the reforms, you can win reforms, but at the end of the day, we have to fight capitalism itself and we have to have a revolution on an international scale to do that. And I think that's the challenge that faces every single one of us here tonight, regardless of what part of the planet we come from. The European Union have attempted uh, on behalf of international imperialism, on behalf of global capitalism, and make no mistake about this, why else would they be negotiating a deal like the TTIPs? Why else would they be building uh, a European and a, a wide battle groups that will link into NATO? They have an agenda that stretches across the planet to squeeze uh, every last resource out of ordinary people and to maintain their power and their privilege and their imperialism at the top of society. What they've done to the Greek people, what they've done to the Irish people, the Portuguese, the, Spain, the Spanish people, and indeed, I bet you if you took a poll in France today, you'd have a vast majority of people saying, we want out of this rotten bosses club as well. So it's a real opportunity for the people here, and I thought I'd put that emphasis on it because we're celebrating, but we also recognise the serious struggle of all our comrades internationally to start breaking through and make a difference and bring people from the idea that we only need a Labour Party or a Sinn Féin and we only need reforms and bring them to the idea that, as James Connolly said, we only want the earth and we need revolution to get it. Thank you, Breed. Right, our final speaker for this evening is Amy Leather. Amy is a leading member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Okay. <laughs> well, really, I mean, what a privilege it is to be up here with all these speakers. Because when you hear from them, who says that change can't happen and what you do makes no difference? Because everyone we've heard from here has been, had everything stacked against them. You know, the big construction bosses who didn't care about workers' safety and wanted to break any militancy or anyone who stood up to them. Or the media who told such lies about the Liverpool fans. Or the politicians who helped cover up the murderous actions of the police at Hillsborough. The governments and states across the globe complicit in locking up innocent people like Mozambique. They had all that stacked against them. They took them on and they made a difference. And that is a crucial lesson for all of us right now. 
because we're here at Marxism just a week after what really was an earth-shattering event, the vote by the British people to leave the EU. Because it really feels, doesn't it, that we're at a crucial, pivotal moment, a moment when society feels like it stands on a knife edge, when anything could happen. And what we're going to do in the coming weeks and months will matter. Because the fact is, that Leave vote has plunged the British and European establishments, in fact, the whole global ruling class, into profound crisis. David Cameron is gone. He's no more. His arrogant gamble to hold a referendum backfired on him. The Tories are split right down the middle. They ripped each other to bits during that campaign. I wrote last night, there's not going to be a smooth transition to Boris Johnson. There definitely won't now, because he's not even standing. <laughs> They're stabbing each other in the back, left, right and centre. Pound and uh, share prices have fallen. The institutions of global capital are floundering about what to do next. And those that thought they had the God-given right to rule the globe and make decisions suddenly found they were not all powerful. But faced with such a crisis for the Tories and the whole establishment, what did the right wing of the Labour Party decided to do? Oh, I know what, we'll not stick the boot in and finish off the government. We'll create our own internal crisis. What an abdication of political leadership. In effect, we don't even have a government, we don't have an opposition. And we are very clear here in the SWP, we may not be in the Labour Party, but we absolutely stand with Jeremy Corbyn against the right wing of that party. The trade unions should not give a penny to those who've stabbed him in the back, but crucially, Corbyn needs to mobilise his support, mobilise it on the streets, like we saw on Monday in Parliament Square when thousands turned out to support him. Mobilise it on the streets and in the workplaces, not just through that limited democracy of the Labour Party, where less than 200 MPs seem to think their votes are worth more than a quarter of a million people that elected Jeremy Corbyn last summer. Because we have to be clear here, the vote to leave the EU was in very large part a rejection of the establishment that people like David Cameron presided over, a rejection of mainstream politicians. The majority of people ignored the advice, not only of the Tories, but also ignored the Labour Party, the SNP, Plaid Kimru, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, Sinn Féin, all the bosses and international financial bodies, ignored all the so-called top executives and all the leaders of dozens of other states across the world, including the US, all of whom campaigned for Remain. In fact, they were lamenting, weren't they? People weren't listening to the experts. But is that a surprise? What on earth did they expect? It is these same experts that have overseen the worst economic crisis since the 1930s. The same experts who've told us that although we didn't cause the crisis, we're going to have to pay for it. When nearly 10 years later, austerity grinds on, making life a misery for millions. When one in five people in the UK live below the poverty line, the three million people are at risk of malnutrition. And at the same time, the number of billionaires in Britain has doubled since the Tories took office in 2010. The wealth of the richest 1,000 people just here in the UK rose by £28.5 billion just last year. I mean, with that rampant inequality, how could there not be an anti-establishment feeling? And when you think about the Panama Papers, revealed how the, t the rich then hide their hoards of cash in offshore tax havens so they don't have to pay tax. Taxes that actually could be spent on education, on hospitals, on council housing, on pensions. You know, David Cameron benefited from these himself. Or when MPs like, are still haunted by the expenses scandal, and when the lies told about the war in Iraq have been exposed many times over, more are going to be exposed with a much-delayed publication of the Chilcot Inquiry next week. Why on earth will people believe what these people have to say about the European Union or anything else for that matter? And it's worth just saying as an aside about the Chilcot Inquiry, something that millions of us know when we marched in 2003 against the war in Iraq, what you should say, that Tony Blair is a war criminal. He has blood on his hands. And as Moa Zambeg said very clearly, Bush and Blair's illegal war in Iraq and the brutal occupation, which at the time they said would bring peace and stability, did the exact opposite. They went in, smashed up the country, stoked up sectarian division, and so created the conditions for ISIS to grow. ISIS is in part a consequence of Western imperialism. And so given all this, given all this, the inequality, the lies and corruption at the heart of the establishment, the vote to leave was not because the majority of people in Britain are stupid. 
or because they're all racist or all fallen for Nigel Farage's lies. It reflected deep anger, frustration and bitterness felt by millions. As Diane Abbott put, uh, Diane Abbott put it, the vote was a roar of defiance against the Westminster elite. Does that mean that racism played no role, though, and isn't a problem? Of course not. There were some truly terrible incidents during and after the referendum campaign, including the horrific murder of Joe Cox uh, by a fascist. But again, how could racism not be a feature when both the official Leave and Remain campaigns and the right-wing media ramped up racism against migrants and dragged the debate to the right? And this didn't just start with the EU referendum, did it? The question of immigration has dominated the mainstream media for years with its vile headlines demonising some of the most desperate people in the world trying to flee war and poverty. And not only in the media, racism has been used by those at the top of society to stir up division, scapegoating migrants and refugees, whipping up Islamophobia. I mean, Cameron spent the last six years doing just that. He attacked multiculturalism. He's used Enoch style style language to describe refugees. He even accused Sadiq Khan, now mayor of London, of being an extremist. And don't forget, as Mozambique talked about, this has all been attacks on Muslims being given state approval by the Prevent programme. In fact, in such an atmosphere, Perhaps what we should sometimes celebrate is actually how many people do reject those ideas and want to help refugees. Actually, a polls have found a third of people in Britain have directly given aid to refugees. Another poll found that actually Britain was one of the most welcoming countries in the world for refugees. 80% of people in this poll said they'd welcome refugees to their town or village. 70% thought the government should do more to help them. Thousands of pounds have been collected, and just in the last few months, donations poured in to take on the convoy to Calais, organised by Stand Up to Racism and the People's Assembly with the trade unions. And it was brilliant to see the hundreds of cars and vehicles lined up on Whitehall, outside Downing Street, to demand Cameron open the borders before setting off to deliver the aid. I'll tell you what, though, the fact that that convoy was then stopped at the border and stopped from going to Calais to deliver that aid makes a complete mockery of the idea of free, of free movement. But you see, but you see, we do know, we do know that some racists do feel emboldened since the Leave vote. There have been attacks this last week on Muslims, on those perceived to be migrants. A minority of racists feel more confident. And that's why, whether we voted for Remain or Leave, we need to unite to both take on those arguments and challenge racism wherever it appears. But you don't do that by half accepting those arguments. When you are faced with a racist onslaught from the top of society, you don't take it on by conceding to the arguments. Don't be surprised if people say they have concerns about immigration if a year ago you were sipping from a Labour campaign mug reading Controls on Immigration. I mean... Don't be surprised either if people say they're worried about migrant workers taking their jobs if you argue there's a problem with the freedom of movement and it should be limited, as some leading figures in the Labour movement are doing. Now, to his credit, Jeremy Corbyn has not lined up with those arguments, but he is in a party where people have conceded on those issues and want to continue to do so. Now, we have a clear position in the SWP. We are against all immigration controls. We are for the free movement of people, for whatever reason, whether they are escaping war and persecution or moving to find a job. Migrants do not cause unemployment or lower wages. It's bosses that cause unemployment and lower wages. We say open the borders. Migrant workers and refugees, they're welcome here. Muslims are not the enemy within, they're our sisters and brothers. And we don't just say these things, we put it into action. We have put it into action every time by working with much wider groups of people when we stopped the BNP, drove back the EDL, campaigned against Nigel Farage and UKIP and stopped them getting elected in Kent. And now we have to do it again to ensure that the racists, the far right, the Nazis and the fascists, that they don't gain from this crisis. Because the point is, we do have to stand firm on these arguments because the anti-establishment feeling, the anger towards those at the top, can go in different directions. And that is a process playing out across the world. It's a process of polarisation, of flux and contradiction. Because at a time when there's such economic crisis, when there's hatred of political elites, when it's clear to thousands that society doesn't work, there comes the question, well, what's the alternative? And the right can also gain a hearing for their answers as well as the left. How else can you explain that there's a support for Donald Trump but also for Bernie Sanders in the US? 
Trump with his nasty, divisive, bullying brand of politics that pits people against each other, and Bernie Sanders, who's put the word socialism back on the agenda? Or how do you explain both the gains for the Nazi Front National in France, but also the tremendous strikes we've heard about that offer a different alternative of how we can fight back? How do we explain that across Europe you see Nazis like Hoffer coming close to winning in Austria and socialists getting elected in places like Ireland? The anger can go in different directions. And in a crisis rack system, the stakes are high. And the, the truth is, the world is not going to go back to how it was before last Thursday. This current situation is full of fluidity and contradiction. But we are not spectators in that process. Nothing is inevitable. Because the point is, as to how do we intervene in that situation and help shape the anger in the right direction? What we say, what we do matters. We want to ensure that the working class, our class, comes out of this stronger and imposes its own solutions, not just watch those manoeuvring at the top. We can't give cover to the establishment or to the Tories. We want to smash apart the institutions of capital and the bosses' organisations. We have to ensure the solutions of unity and solidarity, of challenging the super-rich at the top of society, rather than scapegoating and kicking down at the bottom, those are the solutions that win out. So the point is now, it's not actually about how you voted. The SWP supported a left leave position, but we know that many, many people, anti-racist, campaigners, activists, voted Remain. How we voted is not the main division in society. What is crucial is what we do now to shape that situation and ensure the Tories don't recover, to unite to bring them down, take on austerity and fight racism. I mean, my God, the Tories are so weak. They were weak even before this leave vote. Remember all their U-turns? We could finish them off right now if we had to go. But this is going to take struggle. It's very important that we now have the demonstration on the 16th of July called jointly by the People's Assembly and Stand Up to Racism with the slogan, no more austerity, no to racism, kick out the Tories. We have got to mobilise for that widely, mobilise across the country. But we need strikes too. It's fantastic we've got the teachers strike next Tuesday. We've had university lecturers out on strike um, today. Actually, we're going to hear from a whole series of disputes, just like we have on this platform, but across the whole of Marxism, such as junior doctors fighting to defend the NHS, a whole range of disputes. But we're going to need these on a much bigger scale. I mean, really, what a scandal that our trade union leaders did not fight like the French unions did when the attack came on our trade union rights here. <laughs> so we also need to take on the ideas because we live in such turbulent times. I mean, events are just unfolding so rapidly. Day by day, hour by hour, things are shifting. And we have to have some clear principles to guide us. We have to ensure we have unity against all forms of oppression. After the horrific shooting in Orlando, we had to stand firm against homophobia and be clear this is not a Muslim problem. After the attacks on women in Cologne at New Year, we were clear we stand by those women, but violence against women is not something that is a refugee problem. We have to fight for unity on every issue. Because the fact is, we in the SWP, we're fighting for a whole different world. Socialism is about a different vision of society, one where people's needs come before profit. We want a world without any racism, oppression and exploitation. But the truth is, the path to transforming society to winning that world is not linear or straightforward. Society does not progress or change through some gradual straight line process. When there is such deep economic, political and social crisis like now, there will be massive ructions and there will be battles for ideas and strategy, where those who fight for change will be put to the test, not in easy situations, not in situations we would have chosen, but the ones we're presented with and the choice we have is what do we do in them. And that's why our organisation matters. Because a few weeks ago, we were mourning the loss of the great Muhammad Ali, someone who was bold, he stood up to be counted for his ideas. He took on the arguments over racism, over war, even if it made him unpopular, even if it cost him his career, as it did at one point. He was an inspiration. But there are actually many people, people in workplaces, colleges, neighbourhoods, who inspire others, who offer leadership, who challenge the racist lies, who organise. And we are going to need many more of those people in the days and months ahead to shape society at every level. But rather than doing that individually, we're much more effective when we come together when we're organised. And we need organisation that combines both ideas and the ability to take action and shape events. Because the situation is incredibly unpredictable. 
and we've seen how explosions of anger can take different forms. At heart, we are faced with a crisis of the system, a crisis of capitalism. We need an alternative. Our job is to fight to shape that alternative, to make sure it's one that benefits ordinary people. And so we ask, if you're not a member of the Socialist Worker Party, we want you to join us. Join the SWP and be far, part of that fight. <laughs>